Okay, let's start the uh, morning session. And the, the, the first and the last speaker of this morning session is uh, Terry Gano. And he's gonna uh, talk. This is the third lecture of his talk. And so, okay, so, so please start. <laughs> thank you. Right, thank you for enduring me for um, um, two plus epsilon lectures. So last lecture, the first part of last lecture, we talked about um, the search for the exotic. So, um, so I think that we have a moral, I mean, I think that it's just an exciting thing to look for, the exotic in this. Surely this, we're at the beginnings of a revolution in mathematics. And so let's start to see what our grandchildren will be, will be studying. And so, uh, so I, I want to see what, I want to get some glimpse um, of what, of what the future holds. And so I want to search for the exotic. And uh, so what we looked for were fusion categories. Let's start with the easiest fusion categories that, um, that the only way we can construct them is from brute force. Uh, we don't use any machinery from the 20th century or for that matter, the 19th century. It probably goes back to Euclid, the methods that we're using. And, um, and that the, the reason is just to try to come up with something that, um, that um, has a chance to be exotic. And what we find is that there's lots of examples. Um, surely there are infinite families. So we stopped at wherever we stopped just because the guy had to graduate. And so, but there's no slowness. If, if, if he worked a little bit harder or had to last another month or so, we, we would have gotten, gotten further. So I've, I'm completely convinced those series are certainly infinite. And, um, and we just looked, those are just the two places that we looked. And so if you look somewhere else, then you're going to find infinite families. I think the exotic vastly outnumber the, the 20th century stuff. I don't, mean, I don't want to be condescending for 20th century. I'll talk today about some 20th century stuff. But, uh, uh, but you want to have this combination, I think. That's the exciting thing. And so I think that there's exotic um, all over um, fusion categories. And, uh, and so we're not so interested in fusion categories. We're interested in, let's say, VOAs or equivalent. And so the way to go to VOAs is to step over to modular tensor categories. And there's a generic construction, as you know, to go from fusion categories to modular tensor categories. And that is um, the center construction. And, um, and so we did that. And what we end up with is lots and lots and lots of exotic modular tensor categories. These are surely infinite families. No matter where you point, you'll probably find um, that the exotic ones vastly outnumber the ordinary modular tensor categories. Uh, but what you find that you didn't find in fusion categories is incredible structure. So th these, these exotic modular tensor categories don't look scary. So the, the fusion categories look scary. The, the building blocks of them, these numbers that you solve these equations for, they're algebraic numbers, but they're just barely algebraic numbers. They're very unpleasant numbers, and there's no pattern that I see anyways. I'm not the best searcher for patterns, but anyways, no one has found any patterns in these numbers, to my knowledge. But when you go up to, to modular tensor categories, then you see things that even I see patterns. So there's what we have are exotic constructions of new modular tensor categories. That's the, hopefully the next lecture I give at IMPA, I'll be describing past work where I and collaborators that are much smarter than me probably have constructed these exotic um, constructions of modular tensor categories um, that we're finding from these exotic fusion categories. So we're missing some very basic constructions of modular tensor categories. And when you go one level higher, you ask, are there VOAs? So we don't have a proof yet that there are VOAs that realize this exotic modular um, data, this exotic modular tensor categories. Um, we, do have, we do know that there are exotic modular tensor categories, but we don't know that there are VOAs that are realized by them. But uh, I, I think the evidence is, is pretty clear that, that uh, at least some of them and maybe all of these modular tensor categories, probably all of these modular tensor categories are realized by VOAs. And when you look for hints, you see that it even gets simpler. It even looks more suggestive of a construction at the level of VOAs. So that might be the way that this whole thing goes. There's an exotic construction of VOAs, starting with boring, relatively boring VOAs, very classical VOAs. You smash them together in some new way, perhaps, and you get maybe leaving the world of bosonic VOAs or, um, or rational VOAs or whatever. But then you return to that world um, having begotten 
exotic VOAs. So that's sort of the thing that we talked about in the first part of that lecture. Okay, but we're not talking about it this lecture. Um, what we are talking about this lecture is what we started talking about um, sometime yesterday. Um, and this is the question that started in the 1980s at the very beginning of conformal field theory with, with, um, uh, the, uh, with the work of Capelli, Sixon, Zubert. And so they looked at the um, conf conformal field theories. In their words, they would have been describing the conformal field theories associated to um, SL2 or affine SL2, the vesemino witten models. And, um, and they found, to everyone's surprise, I think, that they fall into an ADE pattern. And um, exploring this um, helped us build up the modern, their work directly led to the modern interpretation of what's going on here. So what's going on here is the existence of a module category. And so I, didn't, I never really gave the definition of a module category, and I'm certainly not now either. But what it is, is meant, what it is meant to be is the categorification of the module of a ring, just like a fusion category is the categorification of a ring. So um, I don't know if what I said is, makes any sense. But anyways, that's, that's what it is. And so you can write down your, the definition of it from that in mind. Um, so it's not a deep definition, and, um, but it's a good definition. And um, what, from our point of view, what's going on is something that should make a lot of sense to VOA people or, or conformal field theory people. What a module category means, so what a full CFT means from this point of view, are chiral, you start with some big VOA, or these, these, you can have two different VOAs, one controlling the left moving and one controlling the right. So in the Capelli, Itzikson, Zubert world, these are the same. They're SL2 at level K. So one of these rational, very nice um, VOAs. So you, and then you maximally extend the one over here. You, you can extend it in some way, you extend the other side in some way, and then what controls the splicing is some tensor equivalence between these things. And so that's what a full CFT is, and that's what a module category is. Okay, and so um, Capelli et Sixon Zubert lived at the world of, of combinatorics. So to them, what this meant was you have an S matrix and a T matrix. This is the modular data of the, um, the modular tensor category for A1 level K in their case. So you have two very concrete matrices, K plus one by K plus one matrices. And you look at all matrices Z that commute with S and T, Um, that have non-negative integer entries and um, there's the tensor unit here. The tensor unit in the notation I'm about to use, the notation I'm using throughout this talk is shifting things by the vial vector. So the tensor unit corresponds to one in this language and so um, the upper left hand corner entry of this k plus one by k plus one matrix is, um, is one. And so it's just a combinatorics problem. And what it is is just the combinatorics, um, always in this categorical stuff, there's the categorification, uh, sorry, there's the anti-categorification. There's the simplification, the combinatorialization of what's going on. So the combinatorialization of a fusion category is a fusion ring, um, categorification of a modular tensor category is the modular data, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is a big part of the categorification of, of the combinatorialization of a, of a module category. So this is called a modular invariant. And so that was what they thought that they were calculating, classifying. And um, that's what they did classify. But Ostrich and Kirillov explained a few years later, a couple decades later, that this is actually the classification of module categories. So the module category classification fits into an ADE classification. OK. So that's what we talked about last class. So now what we're going to try to do is generalize this so what we want to see is what lies beyond A1. So choose your favorite. Let's just deal with the world of, of affine algebras. You could do the same question for anything else, but this is Lie theory. And when Lie theory and, and um, string theory meet, wonderful things happen. So we're expecting wonderful things to happen. And so, um, so my symbol, my notation for this, um, for this VOA, this is the, the rational VOA, the very nice VOA. Um, associated to your simple Lie algebra G and your um, positive integer level K. And so the 
simple modules are parameterized by highest weights. Um, there's some polynomial in k of degree the rank of g. That, that, that tells you how many of these things there are. So there's lots and lots of them. These get bigger and bigger. The rank of these categories is very large. Um, so these are also, you can also interpret these modular tensor categories as coming from quantum groups. So actually, we're not just doing the problem for these affine algebra VOAs. We're doing them for any other VOA that has the same modular tensor category as these VOAs. Um, more generally, we're doing the classification for all VOAs whose modular tensor category is a Galois associate of that of these things. So roughly, um, you can take um, your quantum group at weird roots of unity um, and play the same games and you'll get uh, we're also dealing with those kinds of things. So we're not just dealing with the, with the Lee theory case, but the Lee theory case is what we have in mind. And so our challenge is to find all of its module categories. So as we know what that means is the way that I, I'm not going to live in the world of module categories. I'm going to live in the world of understanding the possible extensions of these VOAs so these are finite index extensions. What that means is if you take this thing, this thing will be amongst other things. So it's a VOA, but amongst other things, it's going to be, it restricts to a module over this thing. And um, what finite index just means is that restriction vanishes in certain places. It's not a problem. It keeps me awake. No, 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 it's, it keeps me awake. I, I prefer to sort of stand free, wave my arms a bit. And so, um, so this restriction, what we mean is just this restriction will be a finite sum of simples of the underlying um, VOA. So it's the ob I think it's the obvious definition of finite index. Okay, um, so um, yeah, you, in the literature you'll often see these, these kinds of things referred to as quantum subgroups. Okay, so let's just look at some of the um, obvious module categories, some of the obvious ingredients that go on here. So um, the, um, outer, the symmetries of the unextended Dinka diagram, so if we're dealing with, let's deal with A2. So for A2, we have an outer automorphism. Yep? So, so is there a statement that uh, any module category would correspond to an extension? So is that, no. a, is that a theorem or is that both? No, no, no. So this is, these are, this is theorem. So, um, so the theorem is that module categories are in bijection. Uh, module categories up to the obvious equivalence are in bijection um, of triples under the obvious equivalence, um, where the triples are these two extensions and this abbreviated uh, equivalence, tensor equivalence. And so module categories for over module tensor categories. So we're assuming that the underlying category that you're doing, the ring here, is a mo Um, no. Uh, well, yeah. Right. So these are fine. So these are finite index extensions. So um, yeah. So these are finite index extensions. So, if, for example, the central charge has to be the same for these. I'm talking about module categories. So, um, so this is what, uh, so, yeah. So the, the, the correspondence to the CFT world is given by papers of Runkel, um, Fuchs, Schweigert, and collaborators. And, um, yeah. Okay, so there's some easy examples of these things. Um, and uh, so one of them are outer automorphisms. And so, um, so symmetries of the unextended Dinka diagram. So this is the A2 Dinka diagram, and so you have uh, you have one outer automorphism here, and so this is, um, and so um, that gives you um, one of these auto equivalences. So that'll give you a very boring um, invertible module category. And um, another generic source of these things are these things called simple currents. I've talked about them before. So these are things that are invertible objects in your modular tensor category. So, um, so uh, um, these correspond to the, um, so maybe A1 is too weird. So if we look at A2, 
This is what the A2 diagram, the extended A2 diagram looks like. And so the symmetries of the extended diagram um, are these rotations. And so to each of these rotations corresponds a simple current. And so you'll get three simple currents um, for A2. And um, one of them is the identity, and the other two are non-trivial. And um, that goes for all the other affine algebras as well. And E8 is a little bit weird, but who cares? And um, it doesn't affect any, well, anything we're talking about. And um, simple currents, these invertible objects in your category, um, are a very, very gentle, friendly beast. They give you um, both autoequivalences, and they give you extensions. And so we saw these in the D series. So there's the D evens and the D odds, and they behave very differently. One of them corresponds to simple current extensions, so strings that live on SO3, and the other one corresponds to, um, to um, nothing in particular. So maybe I'll stand on this side. Um, right, the other one corresponds to some um, um, symmetry. Some, um, so in, in terms of matrices, these, um, these uh, auto equivalences correspond to um, permutation matrices that are symmetries of the fusion rules. And um, the other things correspond to blocks, block diagonal things with lots of zeros on the diagonal as well. Okay, so, um, so these simple current things and these other automorphism things are very well understood. And so basically the question is to find everything else. Now, um, it turns out that, it turns out that, um, that um, the auto equivalences are relatively easy to control. So they're very combinatorial and the jump from combinatorics to, to category theory in this case is, is relatively gentle. And Kane is um, a, an expert on that jump. And so um, Kane has basically solved the auto equivalence part of the problem. So remember we have this triple that we're trying to figure out. And so Kane's, especially for the A series, has worked out the, um, the middle part of the, the automorphic, the auto equivalences of the triple. So um, what's left to do is the, the question of exotic extensions. So um, VOA people are happy at this stage because this is a question that has direct meaning in the context of VOAs. What this refers to are the possible extensions of uh, the affine algebra VOAs. So what are the possible extensions of an affine algebra VOA? This is a question that eventually um, a VOA person would ask because the affine algebra VOAs are very standard VOAs. And so again, the same answer will automatically apply to anything that has the same modular tensor category as these affine algebra VOAs um, and also um, um, any Galois associate of that. So there's lots of other VOAs that'll have the same answer that we're finding right now. But our focus is the affine algebra VOAs. So that's our thing. And so until now, it's been very hard to understand these exotic extensions. Okay. So what's known so far? Well, A1 was known, um, as you know, um, back in the 80s. Um, and then um, I was given as a project when I was a grad student to try to solve this for all the other uh, Lie algebras. So my supervisor obviously had a far greater opinion of me than was at all justified. What I managed to do was A2. So I, oops, I lifted it one higher. Um, you can see Sergei was right. Um, but, um, and so, um, so we get an answer that I'll very briefly describe in a few, in a minute or so. Um, and so, again, I did it at the combinatorial level. So I did it at the same level. I, I found the modular invariants, these matrices. And, um, and uh, but of course, really what's going on is a categorical level. So, um, so that was understood by Ocneanu a few years later, and, um, and then Evans and his um, student um, former student um, put out all the details, published all the details. And um, it's been announced by Ocneanu, who has, um, who had a profound effect on everything I've talked about this week. Um, he announced without any proof or details the, that he has a module category classification for a couple other examples. Okay, so let's just look at A2. This has absolutely no relevance to anything I'm ever going to talk about. You, in fact, you don't want to look at this slide except through squinted eyes. And so to get some idea of the complexity of this, in other words, 
so to get some idea that you shouldn't approach this question directly. Unlike for A1, the S matrix is extremely hideous. So this is not meant to be a nice expression. You can see what's going on in general. What you have is an alternating sum over the vial group. The vial group of A2 is SIM3. So you have six terms here. For E8, you'll have, I don't know, 100 million or something terms because that's the size of the vial group of E8. And, um, and um, these, these things mean stuff in the level of, of Lee theory. This, is, this, this, um, this thing here is the numerator of the, the vial character formula for, um, for um, A2 at elements of finite order. So it means something from Lee theory. Um, but, um, so there's a level K that I've been talking about. And so what I'm going to do is shift all the levels by the dual Coxeter number and everything that follows. And I'm similarly going to shift all of the highest weights by the vial vector, which is just 1, 1. It's just a bunch of 1s. And so I just shift everything by 1s or by the dual Coxeter number just to get simpler numbers, simpler formulas. But even so, this is not a simple formula. This is a useless thing, and you shouldn't look at it very closely. This is certainly not the right way to do this, to approach it directly. Um, but there is an answer that you get. And um, the answer, um, of course, meant absolutely nothing to me. And, um, but a person I'd been communicating with told me a story. So some of you have heard this story. Probably some of you have heard this 100 times. But it's a nice story, so I'm going to say it to you one more time. So this guy, Philippe Ruel, um, was, um, he was a postdoc in Dublin. And so he's walking through a library, uh, the math library in Dublin. And, um, he was sort of just wandering. He wasn't paying any attention to where he was wandering. And soon enough, he found himself, as one tends to, in, a, in an aisle in the library filled from the floor to the ceiling with yellow books. In fact, filled, an aisle filled floor to the ceiling with yellow books written by Serge Lang. And so um, he, he just sort of was just sort of looking at this, oh, isn't that kind of neat? And then he noticed um, that one of these books had a title, and this title was called Complex Multiplication by Serge Lang. And so he thought, uh, no wonder Serge Lang has so many books. If he writes about you know, complex multiplication, probably a shelf over, it'll be complex addition, and maybe exponentiation will be, um, that's in the difficult part of the Serge Lang collection. So he just pulled down complex multiplication just, just to see what can a guy write um, 300 pages on complex multiplication. And so he flicked it open to a random page which was page 26, it turned out. And, um, and on there, he saw um, the combinatorics, the same combinatorics that I needed to solve the, uh, the A2 modular variant classification. It was the same thing. So, uh, so um, in particular, it had to deal with um, civil factors of, of Jacobians, of Fermat curves. And so this was um, discussed in a paper that Royal wrote with a, with a few other authors, including the Ipsixon of ADE fame. And um, so it's other connections of the, uh, um, the A2 classification. And, um, and as far as I know, these connections aren't, aren't established yet. So really what we have are two classifications that as of now are, are fully publicly available, namely the A1 classification, which is ADE, with connections all over the place. And um, A2, which has these weird connections to, um, to Jacobians of Fermat curves. And um, so what about A3? What about A4? What about E8? Um, so that's one of the things that drives me is um, what else do we get? Does it stop there? It's OK if it stops there, but um, it would be kind of fun if, if it went on, if, if we had other interesting connections of this classification. If the module categories classification for the affine algebra, the quantum group modular tensor categories, has lots of connections elsewhere. OK, anyways, um, the main tool that I brought to bear on this problem was um, a Galois symmetry. And I don't know if we want to see the details of this. If you want to see the details of this. This persists in every modular tensor category. You have some kind of a Galois symmetry. So in general, what you have is your S and T matrices, in particular your S matrix. That's the most important. That's the, the hardest matrix to use. So T is diagonal, so it's very clear how to exploit its, any matrix that commutes with it is very clear. But um, it turns out that combining that with S is an extremely cruel thing to demand. But how do you, how do you um, solve, deal with this thing when, you don't, when the S matrix is so incredibly complicated? Even for A2, it's very complicated. Well, you do indirect stuff. So um, 
the S matrix for any modular tensor category um, are, are cyclotomic numbers. They're algebraic numbers, but in fact, it turns out they're cyclotomic numbers. So hit this with any with any um, Galois automorphism of that cyclotomic field. And what you end up with is a sign, and you end up with a different S matrix entry. And the S matrix is symmetric. It's a symmetric matrix. So you get the same sign, or you can write it like this. So by sigma, um, so this isn't a six. This is meant to be a, the Greek letter sigma. And it permutes the highest weights, the simple objects in your category in some mysterious way. Um, but it also, you get this sign. So let's give a name to the sign. And the name I'm giving it is epsilon. So epsilon of our sigma um, of lambda. Um, so it's just some, so here, you get epsilon sigma of mu. So you, get, um, so you get a formula that looks like this, where again, sigma is just a number plus or minus one. So how does this help us? So um, OK. So this goes on in, in, in fact, the way that I found this first was in the, um, in the Lee theory picture, where there's a nice geometric picture of what's going on, what this Galois means. I tried to sketch it on this slide. So these slides are, um, Jethro has these slides. They'll be put up somewhere. So if you want to look at this more carefully later, then you can. But um, there's a geometric picture to this Galois in the Lee theory case, which is very simple. It, it exploits the, the action of the affine Val group on, on um, these uh, cartons of Val subalgebra is the, the weight space. And, um, and that imp that's important, actually, for what I'm going to be talking about later, but I don't want to get into it. So, uh, so we, we apply this, this Galois automorphism. We apply this Galois symmetry here to, um, to our equation. This is the equation for um, the modular invariant Z commuting with S. So S is a unitary matrix, always. And so you can write it this way, if you want, where the star means complex conjugate because transpose is trivial here. And so we apply sigma to that. So this is just a, a number, a, a natural number. In particular, it's rational, so it's invariant under sigma. And sigma is a, is a field automorphism, so I could take sigma of all three of these things. Sigma of the middle thing, once again, is just, uh, it's just the middle thing, unchanged. When I apply it to S, I get, uh, I, I use this operation here. Uh, this Galois symmetry here. And on the other side, I use it on the other index. And so when I put it all together, what I end up with is this thing. So forget the middle part. What you end up with is a symmetry of the, of the modular invariant. Um, it's a symmetry. So um, one entry of the modular invariant equals another entry of the modular invariant, but up to a sign. And what's important here is these things were counting numbers. They count multiplicities. And so they're non-negative integers. And so if this is non-zero, then these signs better all work out to be, uh, the product of these signs better work out to be plus one, or, or we've screwed up. And so, um, so, that's, um, so, that's the, so that's a condition. So in order to have something non-zero, an, an entry of your modular invariant to be non-zero, you have to have uh, these parities, which are determinants of vile transformations. They have to always, that product has to always be one. Anyways, it sounds pretty technical, but that's the way that you do it. And that's the way to do A2. Actually, it's not at all the way to do A2, but it was the way to do A2 back in the 90s. And, um, and so, uh, so you end up with whatever. You end up with the classification. Now, um, and so um, in particular, so if you, do, if you use the Galois um, thing on the A1 classification, then it collapses to about a page. So it's a, it's a massive simplification. But um, you need more to do higher rank stuff, as we'll see. Anyways, um, so, um, so what we get is, so you can say this in fancy language, that there's conditions on, on what you're, we're trying to do an extension. So that means we have this VOAW that's contained inside our VOA for whatever we're doing, A1 level K or A2 level K or whatever. And so we can restrict this thing down to here. We, um, we can forget that it's a VOA and just look at it as a V module. And so we get this as a sum of, of um, irreducibles of this with multiplicity. And so what we get are conditions on what these things could possibly be. So they have to satisfy the Galois condition. That's what this totally positive thing is. Don't worry about this. And then you also have a condition that it has to commute with T. So all of these things in here, in this restriction, have to have the same um, twist as um, as, 
as the tensor unit does. Um, and so you get some conditions. So these are uh, the conditions that come from, these are the conditions here that come from, that, that you're forced to have for anything that lies in the restriction of your extension to your underlying VOA. So let's just call it R, and let's not pay attention to what that, those conditions are. And so, um, so, so in fact, what I showed was that, oh, in fact, what I didn't show, but what, what you can show is for A1, uh, then um, you get that the only, the only possibilities for R, the only possible things that could lie in a restriction of an extension down to the A1 level K VOA are simple currents. And so that means you have a simple current extension and that we, those we understand completely. The only two exceptions, it turns out, are the shifted level 12 or the shifted level 30, which indeed are exceptions. So, um, so, it's a, so it's a very powerful tool. The problem is it's very, very, very hard to work out. And so when you try to do this for A3 um, or C2 or G2, um, you, you can't prove. Um, it's, Galois still turns out to be a very positive constraint, but it's very, very hard to prove that um, the same theorem I mentioned for A1, where after a certain point, the only possible things in the restrictions are simple currents. So that's not the right way to do it. So, but, but there's so much information here that we've forgotten. So you should take a step back. Now, let's take a big step back. Let's take a step back to finite groups. That's the, that's the, the essence, the bedrock of all of this, finite groups. And so when we look at the representation of finite groups, um, restriction, the kind of thing that we've been using up till now, well, is of course a big part of the theory. But another big part of the theory, a much more interesting part of the theory, is induction, which goes in the opposite direction. So not all of you know about induction, and so I'll say a very few quick words about induction. So um, let's, let's do a very basic example, namely um, SIM3, and we'll let's take Z3 as its subgroup. So here's the character table of, of um, SIM3. You've all seen it before. And so on this, it looks like my representations are, are labeled by the rows. So this is going to be one, the trivial representation, the sign representation, and the two-dimensional representation, which I'll be calling tau for two. And uh, the, the columns are labeled by the conjugacy classes. So this is the conjugacy class of the identity in, the, in SIM3. This um, looks like the um, things in it's the transpositions. So, for example, this this thing here, and the other the other three transpositions, and this thing here will be the order three elements. These are the three um, conjugacy classes in S three. Okay, and now um, so this is this is Sim three, and this is its subgroup, um, which is Z three, or if you prefer, um, this, this this thing here. And so this is a very easy group. Its character tables are things that, its character table is something that we know very well. And so it's just a diagonal matrix. No, yeah, it's a, it's, um, it's given by, um, so you have your one, your, I'm calling this some strange Greek letter and some strange Greek letter conjugate. These are all one dimensional representations. This is the trivial representation. This is some other thing and this is uh, one, three, two. And so this is the trivial representation. Um, this is, um, so all of these are ones, and this is going to be some third root of unity, who cares which one. And this is third root of unity, conjugate, conjugate. So this is the character table for, the, for Z3. And you can see by restriction, you can see what one has to be. So the restriction of one, of course, is one. So this is this is the restriction that goes from SIM3 to, um, so this is the world of SIM3, this is the world of Z3. And then um, this, the uh, um, sign representation is going to correspond to, um, the sign representation corresponds to, so we restrict to what it is here, and that's given by one. And what it's here, well, it's the same conjugacy class as this, so it's also given by one. and so. The restriction of the sign representation is also one. And last but surely not least, the restriction of the two-dimensional representation is, you can do it yourself, um, is going to be um, funny Greek letter, um, orthogonally direct, uh, the direct sum of that with 
funny direct Greek letter with a bar on top. So that's the restrictions from S3 to its subgroup um, Z3, right? We all know about that. But you can go in the other direction, and this is induction. And, um, and so there's lots of different ways to talk about induction. You can look at it in a level of matrices where you'll get a block, um, a permutation matrix, where each of the blocks is, uh, is, a, is one of the matrices from your original representation that you're coming from. So induction goes from representations of your smaller thing up to representations of your bigger thing. And the great thing about induction is that generally the smaller group is better understood. At least if you choose a smaller group so that it's better understood. So that then, um, then um, you, can, and you, you want to understand the representations of the big thing. And so induction is a very useful, it goes in the right direction. And um, so uh, anyways, I summarize things up there. There's a formula for, there's a definition for induction that's the easiest definition for induction is given by this. Um, and um, so restriction is a tensor functor. So for example, restriction, what that means is restriction of the tensor product of two representations. So these will be two representations in S3, for example, the big thing. And if you restrict it, what you get is um, the tensor product of the restrictions. So this, is, this tensor product lives at the level of G. This tensor product lives in the layer of the, in the level of the subgroup. Um, induction, however, does not work that way. So in some way, the natural, what this means, I guess, is the natural thing here really is restriction, but it's also the boring thing. Um, and then we have Frobenius reciprocity, which is given by this formula here. And um, because of this formula, this is, things that with this formula, um, this is where the name adjoint functor comes from. So it looks like the adjoint of a linear operator. Anyways, we have Frobenius reciprocity, whatever that means. Okay. Now, um, it turns out we also have induction for VOAs, but it works a little bit different. In fact, it works in a much more interesting way, um, as things always are for VOAs. And so, um, yeah, so this goes back, al as almost everything does in this area, to the subfactor people in the 1990s um, and very early 2000s. And, um, and in this case, what's interesting is, I'll, I'll describe this a little later in my talk if I have time, um, but um, uh, let me just describe what it is in, uh, in words. Um, so it, it goes, by, so induction goes from, so, so for the VOA level, what you have are your two VOAs. So you have your W, which is the extension of our VOA. So we're thinking of this as being an affine algebra VOA, but it doesn't have to be. And we want this, though, to be a finite extension. And, um, and so induction takes, it goes in the direction that you want it to go in. It takes modules for this thing and lifts them to modules of some kind for this thing up here. So it goes in the right direction. Restriction goes in the boring direction. Now it turns out, uh, miraculously here, arrows are reversed. There's a contravariant functor between um, groups and VOAs. So there's, so arrows are reversed. So actually induction for VOAs is the tensor functor, amazingly enough. The interesting thing is the tensor functor. It has the extra structure. It's the natural thing here. Um, and, but you have, for, you have Frobenius reciprocity again. So these things are adjoints of each other. Um, and then there's an example here, which is the way to understand the ADE diagrams of Capelli, Zixon, Zubert. So this is the modern way to think about these ADE diagrams. So, um, the, so one, of the, one of the exceptions, um, one of the exceptional um, modular invariants here is that K equals 28 or kappa equals 30 if you shift it by the dual coxeter. And um, so this corresponds to um, an accident, to turn, uh, that, that's a pretty common accident, that the bigger thing is also an affine algebra VOA, in this case, G2 level one. And so um, what these symbols are up here, what these are, there should be a comma there, but I was running out of space. So this is the tensor unit 
for G2 level 1. So G2 level 1 is ranked 2 um, as a category. So it has two simples. One of them is here, the tensor unit, and one of them is here. So I'm shifting things by the vial vector. So really this is 0, 1, and this is 0, 0. And these taus are various twisted modules. So induction goes to twisted modules. Not twisted in the group, in the G-twisted modules sense of VOAs, but in a more general sense that we'll talk about later, I hope. So almost everything, so, okay, I'll, I'll write this down shortly. So it goes to non-local modules. And then you can restrict, maybe I should write it down here. So induction goes from the representation theory of the smaller VOA, and for groups, it would go to modules for the bigger VOA. But here, it, unfortunately, it overshoots. And it goes to what I'm going to call twisted modules. But this is a bit of an abuse of terms. It's going to cause confusion. So, but I'm going to use it anyways. And so these are, so it, it goes to non-local modules. So again, we'll talk more about this stuff later. So induction goes too far. But contained inside here is a subcategory. How do I write this? Well, this is, this is um, inclusion. So a subcategory um, of, of this is the true modules for W. So, um, so you can certainly restrict from here to there just by just forgetting the, that, that you have a module for the big VOA and just restricting to the sub VOA, V. But in fact, you also have a restriction more generally from here. And so this restriction and this induction are adjoints of each other. And so in this diagram, what we do is we, we write down the Mackay graph for, I don't know, I'm wasting too much time on this. We we'll write down the Mackay graph for, um, for this extension here. So we have, so for the Mackay graph, you have, a, you have one node, which is the unit, and then you have your defining representation, your two-dimensional representation or whatever. Um, so this is the, this is, a twist, one of the twisted modules of, of uh, corresponding to this extension here. So one of the um, G2 comma 1 twisted modules. And so if I tensor by this thing in the, in, the, in the twisted module category, then I fill out the Mackay graph in the usual way, and what I get is E8, um, finite E8. And so, so this is the meaning, the modern meaning to ADE for Capelli. Okay, now, um, what does this have to do with, what does induction have to do with modular invariant classifications? Well, the key was undoubtedly understood by Ocneanu uh, in the late 1990s. And um, um, who knows for sure, but almost certainly he knew what, what, I'm, gonna, what I'm calling Ocneanu's lemma. So um, it sounds pretty harmless enough, but... Um, do I say what small means here? Okay, I do. And so, um, so if you have, so this, it just applies to affine algebra um, modular tensor categories. So uh, there's, so to find analogs of this for, there's no analog of this for a general modular tensor category. So it's specific to some accidental facts for affine algebras. And so what Ocneanu's lemma talks about is a property of these extensions. So if you have a small enough um, highest weight, where small, where it means small, in the sense that I write down there in the lemma. So basically, it means the Dinkin labels are small, then um, small compared to the level. Then induction will be simple. So it'll typically be a twisted module, which is which is fine, but it'll be simple. And so, um, if you're clever enough, and Ocneanu certainly was clever enough, then you can use that to get bounds on the level of an exotic extension. So what you'll get is an upper bound for that. You'll get some level k. And if, you're, if the, the level you're interested in is bigger than that, then all possible extensions are simple current extensions. So you'll get some bound on the, the upper bound for exotic extensions. And so um, the bounds you get were worked out for, so I don't know if Ocneanu ever worked them out for anything else. But um, Andrew, uh, Andrew um, Shuprai, who's a postdoc of mine, and looking for a job, by the way, in his PhD thesis, um, recovered Ocneanu's lemma, um, published it, and worked it out explicitly what it is for other algebras. And so what you get is um, 
is bounds like um, 18 million for the level. So once you're, if your level is higher than 18 million, then your G2 modular invariant extension, your G2 extension has to be a simple current extension. So that's what you get. So it's great. It tells you that there's only finitely many simple current extensions, but unfortunately, the bounds grow like grow exponentially with the number of roots. So expon exponentially with the rank squared. And so it's to it very quickly becomes totally useless. In particular, for G2, it's totally useless. Yep. Was that first of the coincidence? Oh, maybe, it's, maybe I screwed up. It's sort of an unconscious flip. It looked, as, the, as the screen was going blank, it looked kind of, yeah, that's kind of amazing, hey? It must be just a, I'm pretty sure it's a coincidence. It must be a coincidence. These are far from tight bounds. So there's nothing, these, these are just um, one approach to get a bound and um, you get certain numbers, but the actual exotic um, extensions um, no longer exist long before that. The biggest uh, exotic extension is at something like level 15 or something like that. So this is just a coincidence. Okay, well, so my contribution to this, um, my recent contribution, so Andrew's work was fairly recent, about four or five years ago. And so my contribution is to, is to combine Galois and Akhtianu, Akhtianu's lemma. And um, I'm starting to take too much time, so maybe I'll go a bit faster. Um, and so, and so, um, if, so the idea is we know what, this again is, pecu is peculiar to affine algebras. So we know how Galois, there, any, any modular tensor category will have induction, um, any associated to extensions, and we'll also have a Galois action. But um, in the special case of the affine algebras, things are always special. And one thing you get is the Ockmiani lemma, this, this very strange looking, but actually surprisingly useful fact. Um, and also, you get um, a special property about Galois, namely that it's, it has a geometric meaning. And so in particular, it's clear that if you're L, so these, I told you our world is cyclotomic. And so, so our fields look like this. So we have some n through to unity. And so the Galois group, as you all know, are just numbers. The numbers co-prime to n. And so take, so any Galois automorphism corresponds to some integer l co-prime to n. And so if you take an, your integer l to be small compared to the, compared to the level and the rank of your algebra, then um, then your, the Galois associate will be clear. So normally what you do is you take your weight, to get the geometric picture is you take your weight, which is, a, which is some vector in a, in a weight lattice, you multiply it by L, the, the scalar L, in the usual boring way. So you just, each stinking label gets multiplied by L. And then you vial fold it to move it into the L cove, so whatever that means. So you have to, you have to make sure that it's not, um, there's only finitely many level k highest weights. And so, um, but if your L is small enough, then um, the sum of the Dinkin labels, so in order to be, so this will be, so you can think of this as a vector, L1, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda whatever your rank is, and multiplying it by L just gives you this. And um, to be a highest weight vector, level k highest weight vector, all these have to be non-negative integers, actually positive integers in our picture, and the sum of these numbers has to be less than what I'm calling kappa. So the sum of these things is bounded roughly by k, and, um, and that's the condition. So if L is small enough and your lambda i's are small enough, then this thing will lie inside the, it'll be a level k highest weight, and that will be the Galois associate, the Galois permutation of your lambda. So if we apply this to the vacuum, the vacuum is rho in this language. That's the vial vector. That's one, 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 one. So if L is small compared to the level, more precisely, if L times the rank is less than kappa, which is k plus the dual Coxeter number, then LLLL is the highest weight. Um, and so let's assume that. Let's assume that L is small. Then um, by Galois symmetry, we know that um, then um, Z of L L L L L L L L L comma L L L L L L L equals one, um, and so that tells us that okay. Um, so now if so, I think there's a typo there. 
course, this should be if L times rho is really small in the Occhiomanic sense. So that's an even stricter, even harder to be that small. That's a much stronger requirement. Then this in will be simple. Um, and um, this is telling us that L times rho is going to be a local module. So um, anyways, the argument is here. And um, you'll have to trust me on it. It's not, a, it's not a terribly complicated argument. It's just combining the Galois symmetry and the geometric picture of Galois with Okniani's lemma. And what you obtain is surely written down here. So I'm writing it down in its strongest form, but actually its, it's, it's use, most useful form is a simpler version of this, a corollary of this, but who cares? I'm telling you more than you want to know, I'm sure. And so, uh, so what you get is um, you, can, you get a vastly smaller, you get, you get another constraint on, at least when, when your kappa has numbers to it that are co prime numbers co-prime to this kappa um, that, are, uh, that, are small, that are small enough in the Okniani sense, then um, you're going to get uh, severe cons constraints on what your R's can be. So this, this just gives you, do I say more hints or do I just, OK. So I don't, I don't say this. So I, unfortunately, I'm required. My, these notes aren't explicit enough for me to precisely remember what's going on. But, um, so this is an extra condition on the possible values of your, so we have our extension, W, of our VOAV. And um, one possibility always is that this, this restriction just involves simple currents. So let's ignore any simple currents that might arise, and let's, it, we're focusing on any lambda that might, um, that, that isn't a simple current that lies in the restriction of W to V. Then lambda has to satisfy all kinds of constraints. It has to satisfy this totally positive condition that I mentioned before coming from Galois. Um, it has to have the right twist. And also, it has to satisfy this new condition, this Ockmanu plus Galois condition. And that kills off almost everything, very easily. Kills off almost everything. So, um, so for A1, the only things that survive are these two levels. So what this means is only when K plus the dual coxeter equals 12 and 30, those are the only possible ones that have any chance to have an exotic extension. For A2, it's these ones. And so uh, um, the bold face means there does exist an extension there, an exotic extension. So for A3 and A4, et cetera, this is the answer that you get. So for A6, for example, um, you get three. For most of these, it, you're getting three places where there actually are exotic extensions and a handful of other things, going roughly like the rank squared, where, um, where things that survive my tests but so have to be handled by ad hoc methods. Uh, yep. So in the other one cases, you know that there are no exotic extensions? Yes, I know that. So this is the classification of all. I know the I have the classification of all um, exotic, of all extensions for all algebras up to and including rank six. And so this is the answers. So the bold face is part of the answer. I mean, I haven't, that's where they occur, but I also know what these extensions are. And so similarly, here's what B, just for the hell of it, that's what B6 looked like, and that's what D4 looks like. And uh, so again, as you can see, it's generally the number of levels that survive are quadratic, grow quadratically with the rank. So it's a much better bound than the original, the Akhmianu or Shuprai bound of exponential. So for E8, you'll get something like, um, I don't know, maybe there'll be 100 levels. I haven't worked out E8 yet instead of a Google, well over a Google. And, um, and so you can also see that this overshoots things by quite a bit. The actual answer is just something like three or four. Um, that's the only levels where there are exceptionals. So you could, even, you could do better, but this is good enough. OK. So as I say here, there's all possible. Uh, this has been worked out for everything. and. Um, um, the numbers I'm about to give you should not trust. So they're all written up in a paper that will be released um, in the early summer. But every time I count, it's, the results are still scattered 
on all the different pages. And so I have to flip through the pages and count, oh, there's an exotic extension there and, and stuff. And so um, I've never counted, got the same numbers twice. So, but they're going to be very close to this, so within one or two in either direction. So, um, so, um, the, so the easiest source of these things are when this thing is also an affine algebra algebra. So we saw this, for example, in the G2 um, level 1 contains um, A1 level 28. So almost all of these are of this type. So these are Lie type conformal embeddings. Um, and um, there's a few that involve um, mirror extensions or rank level duals. Um, and there's only four or I think five. So this might not be right. Uh, I think that's five extensions that, um, that are truly exotic. And so actually, one of the places where I, where I construct these things, so to prove existence, the hardest thing is to prove existence. And so the best source of existence comes from the C equals 24 holomorphic VOA classification. So for example, you can see one of them right here. Okay. As I say, these slides are available, and the paper will be available pretty shortly as well. Um, so the moral of the story um, is that these affine algebra VOAs have very few extensions, or very few exotic extensions. The only extensions come from simple currents in general. And, and then uh, to second approximation, um, almost everything of everything that's left over are these Lie theory extensions, which are very well understood. So there's very, very, very few um, extensions that aren't of that type. Um, and so, um, anyways, there's a lesson here um, that, uh, as, as I say up there, that um, this was a dead problem, I think. Um, so there's no real work done on this, really, from the 1990s to the present day until, uh, until we understood some, we trickled down some of the information that came from the category picture. And... Um, Okay, anyways, um, so the big question is what in the world, um, so let's go back to the pattern. Remember for A1, we had an ADE classification. For A2, we have this connection to Jacobians of Fermat curves. So what happens after this? So I'm not the person to, um, to answer that kind of a question, but um, um, probably some of you are, or at least you're certainly better than me. So it would be, be fun to look back at these, that, at these classifications that you get and to try to see connections to geometry, it looks like, um, and, and see um, what geometry knows about these classifications. Again, this is only part of the story. This is the extension part of the module category of the full CFT thing. But, um, but um, the other side is also known, so, so you can combine them. And Okay. Yeah. Yeah, module category, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so you say module category is the same that two extension and an isomorphism between them, okay. And so it's not because we have an extension that we have a module category, it looks like. Sorry, I didn't quite get it's that. It's not, uh, so, so you, you care about classification of extension, but it's not, for example, every level that was in bold, you have an extension, yeah. but it doesn't mean that you have a module category, right? It does mean you have a module category. It does mean. So um, one way, if you have an extension, so again, this isn't my theorem. This is a theorem that goes back, well, um, at the, okay. There's a history for this theorem, but it, most recently and in the generality that, um, in the greatest generality, this was a theorem that was proved in a paper by Davidoff, uh, Muger, I'm going to forget. Uh, people, and it's going to be embarrassing, I should just stop there, and several other people who are at least as important as these two people in the writing of this paper. And the paper has VIT in the title, and it was somewhere around 2013 or thereabouts. And in this paper, they give um, their version of this theorem. I, I think Ostrich is one of the people in here. I could give you the reference if you want, but there seems to be some uncertainty about this. So uh, this is the theorem that says that if you have a module category, for um, a module tensor category, 
then it's a triple. This is the same as a triple. And so this triple, you can write in, this word, in these words, you have a left extension, you have a right extension, in, in our sense of the word, so a finite extension of the corresponding VOA, and you have a, a tensor equivalence, let's call it theta. And so let's imagine that we have um, an extension, so one of these bold face things here. So for example, G2 level one and A1 level 28. So this is the thing we're interested in, I mean the thing that we're starting with. We wanna know module categories for this thing, but we've discovered, we've read that there's an exceptional, there's an extension up to this thing over here. This is a finite index extension. Then we can take this thing here, let's call this W. Then we can put W here, put W here, and put the identity here. And so you get an extension. And in fact, whenever you do this, then you're gonna get your modular invariant is gonna look like a sum of squares. It's not an if and only if, but if it's of this type, then it's gonna look like a sum of squares. And so that indeed is what the E8 modular invariant looks like on so just to be sure I follow, so for, for SL2K, they fall into a D series, yeah. and they three E's, E6, yep. E7, E8, yep. but only two level when you accept yeah, someone which right. is not simple current. Right. So that's one of the E's simple current, or what does it mean? Yeah, so what's going on there, so the three E's, we have three E's, E6, E7, E8, and so this is E8, so I, I gave you in more detail than you'd ever want to know why it's E8, you can actually fill out the E8 Dinka diagram by using induction and restriction and tensor product. And similarly, um, you get C2 at level one I, uh, um, contains um, A1 at level 10. So you have this thing here. This is the E6 um, thing on, on Capelli's list, Capelli et al's list. And, um, and this thing is also this form. So you have your, your W identity W, so the modular invariant looks like a sum of squares, um, the partition function. Finally, you have the E7 one, that's the one you're asking about. And so E7 has to have a triple to it, everything has to have a triple. And the triple there is a simple current extension at level 16. So this, we have a name for this, this is one of the Ds, D8 or D something. Um, we have a simple current extension, exactly the same simple current extension. So these are non-exotic extensions at level 16. So again, this is one of the Ds. I don't know what D it is, D10 or D8, I forget. And you have to have something in here, and it better be exotic, or it's not, doesn't deserve an E name, it deserves something else. And what this is, is an exotic auto-equivalence. So the exotic modular cat module categories have to have either an exotic extension or an exotic auto equivalence. And so to finish off the whole module category classification for A6, for example, what you'd have to do is run through, so we know the answer from my list of all of the possible Ws, and then you'd have to understand all of the different um, auto equivalences between these things. But the miracle is there's so few um, there's so few exotic extensions, and it all turns out that they have relation. They're, they're either spot on a uh, modular tensor category for an affine algebra thing, for example. That's gonna be the case here for obvious reasons, but sometimes for unobvious reasons, you get back a, a affine algebra, a quantum group modular tensor category, or a Galois associate of one of those. You have the same um, classification in that case. It turns out that for all of the things on my list, you know the automorphism, you, you know the auto equivalences. So, so you, you, thanks to the work of Kane. So, um, so, we, we, so we get from this the, the um, module categories classifications. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yep. Can you say what, what is non-local? What is what? Right, so non-local means it's not local, and so in particular, it doesn't satisfy the, uh, the you know, the, the locality axiom that you'd have for a, a VOA. So what this is in, I'll talk about this in the next part of my talk, but I, 
can um, say it right now. So these are um, in the category. So in the VOA world, uh, to be honest, I think that we don't completely know. The, the, we are not completely sure. I would guess what really to call what these things really are. So we're still under, trying to understand this part of the story. This this is non-local. Yeah, that's right. So what? So at the categorical level, it's everything is clear. So um, it's the categorical level. So you have. I'll talk about this in a second or so, but I can very quickly say it right now. So uh, this is a part of the story that I think you understand completely. So you have an algebra, a commutative algebra associated to any of these, um, to any of these extensions. This is just uh, going to be um, the restriction of the extended VOA in this case to. Um, to V. So this thing as an object in the category mod V, mod the smaller thing, has a structure of a commutative algebra. Um, and um, the twisted modules are going to be um, the representations of this, um, of this algebra. And so contained inside here, these are typically non-local. So that, that means they don't satisfy a locality axiom, but contained inside here, is a small subset that are local ones, and these ones are ordinary modules of W. So the, the ordinary modules of W are a, is a small full subcategory of this category of um, representations of your commutative algebra A. So these are the twisted, these are one of the things I'm calling twisted modules. So in the case of orbifolds by finite groups, these literally are the twisted modules. Um, and so they satisfy some kind of a locality thing, but with a twisted one. They're non-local in this sense. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Okay. So yeah, so I'm. Yeah, so twisted. So uh, the, the, my only nervousness is just that when I say twisted modules, I know what I mean, but everyone else thinks they know what I mean, but it's not what I mean. <laughs> twisted modules normally means in the twisted, twisted, you know, the G-twisted module thing, right. and that's a that's a special case, but a very small special case. So there's a better name probably than twisted modules, but that's the word I insist on using for now. Of V mod, yep, that's right. That's the smaller. And now you're looking in the larger category that is abstractly constructed for modules over this community value. Well. Yeah, that's right. And whatever this is, is what we're calling this non-local. That's right, exactly. So there's a there, there's going to be a meaning in terms of VOAs. I think it just takes probably 20 minutes or so um, for some of us to sit in the same room and nail it down. But um, so it's not like it's going to be a hard definition. But I don't think it's been written down. You can. Yeah, so it's um, so it's it's it, it's obviously related to the tensor product structure in mod v, but it's it's um, smaller than that. You, there's things quoted out by that. Yes, yeah, so, but it's completely defined. It's it's very explicitly defined. So at the categorical level, it's clear what's going on. Okay. So is that? Can I have one question? Yeah, of course. So could you show me the, I mean, this of the levels of the t tables? Yeah. Yes, this one. So, so the bold one is, uh, bold one corresponds to the really exists exotic extensions, right? That's right. It's, it's and, uh, like. I, I, I just wonder, I mean, for, for this case, do, do, do you have, can you also prove the uniqueness of the exotic extension? Yeah, so I prove, uh, in my paper, I prove uniqueness in existence. But it, 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 it is not, not automatic. You, we have to prove it, am I right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's definitely not automatic. Okay. And definitely I have no problem stealing um, the theorems from the VOA side. Yeah, for example, AS, 
energy to write up my slides, so um, I was at this point for the last topic switching to the blackboard. And so we only have 15 minutes, and so there's not much I can really say here, but maybe I'll say something anyways. So let's move to the blackboard. And so what I was going to talk about was um, uh, going completely opposite the, the theme of my my yesterday's talk where I talk about exotic stuff, um, um, I was going to describe work in progress with a student of mine who will be finished in about a year and looking for a PhD somewhere. He's a very strong student. His name is Andrew Reason. And so we're working on um, onward group theory. So where VOA theory does a deep dive into group theory. And so, um, in particular, look at, um, in particular, look at um, um, a VOA. So if you look at a lattice VOA, then a lattice VOA um, has a modular tensor category. It's a rational VOA, and therefore, the category of modules of your, um, of your, um, um, of your lattice VOA is going to be a modular tensor category. And the fusions are, so what it is is just the group algebra. So the fusion ring is going to be the group algebra of the dual of the lattice quotient, your lattice. So your lattice here is an even positive definite lattice. So it contains its dual, or its dual contains it. And so you do this quotient, it's a finite abelian group, and the fusion rules are given by this. The, the simple objects are in um, natural bijection with the, these cosets. Okay. And um, from the, the lattice structure, you get um, your S matrix, which comes from the dot product on these um, cosets, exponentiated. And the T matrix, the twist matrix, comes from the quadratic form on your dual lattice um, cosets, uh, exponentiated appropriately. And so you get your, your S and T matrices very clearly, very explicitly. Now, um, so this is our starting point. And so in particular, let's call this thing this group here, which underlies the, the representation story of, of this thing. Let's call it, give it a name. Let's call it A, because it's an abelian group. Um, so this modular tensor category, if you forget the braiding on it, is just going to be VEC omega A, right? Where omega is some three-co-cycle, there's a very good chance to be trivial in this case. OK. Um, and then. Um, uh, the idea is to take some group G of automorphisms. So it's a finite group of automorphisms of your VOA, your lattice VOA. And then you ask yourself, what about the modular tensor categories of this orbital fold? So here we have the same structure we've been talking about over here. We have a big VOA, which I'll call VL, which I'm calling VL, and you have your smaller VOA, which we're calling VLG. So this is a very special case, generically, I think. It's not at all a generic case of having a sub-VOA. The generic case will be one of these fusion, um, fusion category orbifolds. So you replace G with a fusion category, whatever that means, and do the, the orbifold by your fusion category, whatever that means. This does mean something, so that's a promise. But, um, but what it means is far from clear right now. Um, and so this is a very com much more concrete situation, much more classical situation. And what you'd expect is this modular tensor category is going to be um, governed by A, um, the quadratic form on A. So I'll call that Q or Q sub A. And given by G and lots of cohomological data of stuff like G. And so you throw all this into some kind of a hat, and out will, should come this modular tensor category, right? And so this, so um, what we're working on is just um, there's been very little communication, especially in the COVID years, between the tensor category community and the VOA community. And so the idea is is just to um, to take advantage of this absence of commu of communication and and um, say what what we can say about these module categories. 
So let me give one example of how easy it is to say things. And then I'll stop there. I had a lot more I wanted to say, but you'll have to wait for my next talk in some continent far, far away. So let's deal with um, the baby of all of these possible cases, uh, perhaps maybe even the most important of these possible cases. Let's consider some V away V, um, which is holomorphic. So again, what this means is um, its category of modules is trivial. Its representation theory is trivial. So VEC is a very boring modular tensor category. It's the most boring of them all. It's the unit among all of the tensor categories. OK, and, um, and we take some group G, some finite group G of automorphisms. Now, everyone knows it's a conjecture that goes back to the 1990s by Digraph. And people that were students or postdocs of his at the time. Um, that, um, so we're going to assume in all of this that, um, so V and VG, this is our underlying assumption. V and VG are completely rational. So this is a theorem in conformal nets, which I take to be more or less the same as VOAs. And so, um, so take, it as a conject take it as an assumption for now. It's, we're, we're moving pretty quickly toward a proof of this, I think, in the VOA setting. But in conformal nets, it's already a theorem. Um, but just assume it for now. So we're assuming that, um, that V and VG are completely rational. In fact, let's take V to be holomorphic. Um, and uh, then the conjecture is that the modular tensor category of VG is equal to VEC G omega, the center thereof, for some three cycle. Okay, so there was some work done in, I don't know, around 2002 by Kirillov. Um, which, which um, handled the untwisted case. So if all of the representations of centralizers that are coming in are true representations, um, then he showed that you get the double, the untwisted double. And six months ago or so, um, so in 2021, um, Dong, Oh boy, was it Richard Ng or was it Feng? I think it was Feng Shu and um, someone else who I'm forgetting who did at least an equal job of the other two. Um, that's not the reason I'm forgetting it. Um, finally proved this. But it was a pretty complicated proof from what I can see. It wasn't a trivial proof. What I'm going to do is explain to you that this is a, a trivial statement. This is not a deep statement. If you put together all the pieces that we have, and I have four minutes to do it, so it better be pretty simple. So, um, so the first step in the proof is, so we have our twisted modules. So in my language, which seems to be different than everyone else's on the planet, these are, so these are G-twisted modules of our holomorphic VOA, this thing here. So I think other people use the notation rep V. But I think that isn't the good. I prefer this notation, so I'm, I'm going to use this notation. So this is the category. These are the twisted, the G-twisted. This is the category, the tensor category, the fusion category of G-twisted um, V mo uh, V modules. And so uh, we know from a recent paper, from 2019 or so. We don't need this for um, for this. Um, for this proof, but we know that this has a name. It's called the G cross braided. It's an example of a G cross braided um, extension of, of mod V. But we don't, that's not something that we need to know. But it's a, it's a fusion category. But it's a fusion category that has extra structure on it. 
Okay. So first of all, so, so the first step in the proof, so we have this thing here, and we know quite a bit about this thing. Um, one thing that we know is that it's pointed. So what pointed means is everything is a simple current. So um, more precisely, everything is invertible in this category. So the way to see this is uh, the result of, of Dong and Feng, and um, I'm, I'm not sure who else was involved in this paper, which says something along these lines. So if you have some set of things for every pair of elements in your, in your um, group, G, so these will have to commute with each other, um, you let this be the set of all simple G-twisted modules. Uh, which are stable, which are H-stable. So you can compose, so let's call these modules something, let's call them uh, M, which have, when, you, when we twist by um, the automorphism H, we get back the same module. So then um, what we find is the cardinality of this set there's an SL2Z action that, that operates on these things, and it preserves the cardinality of these sets. So in particular, um, the number of G-twisted, simple G-twisted modules V modules equals the number of G stable true modules, true V modules, untwisted V modules, local V modules. And in our case, um, there's only one um, simple V module, and um, it is, it's the tensor unit, it's stable for all G. So it's one. So for each G, we have exactly one thing. Yeah, so it must be pointed. So in particular, the inverse of, of the unique G-twisted module, which we'll call this, the inverse of it is going to be, I, I know its name, it's called the unique G-inverse twisted module. The tensor product of these two things has to be a sum of zero twisted, one twisted modules, and these are just, there's only one of those. It's the it's V itself. Okay, so this thing is pointed. And therefore, by tensor category nonsense, this thing is just VEC, it's tensor equivalent to VEC G omega, or I should say, um, it, it's twisted to some, it's, it's the same as, as VEC, as the H-graded vector spaces that are omega twisted for some H, for some group H, and some omega that's in that's a three cycle of H. These are, th these are all of the fusion categories that are pointed. And it's easy to see, I'll leave that as an exercise, that G and H have to be isomorphic. So we may as well not call this H, we may as well call it G. And there's a relation, again, from tensor category nonsense that says that um, that um, any time you have your, your twisted modules, this is twisted modules in a general sense, so maybe I'll use slightly fancier language. The representation, um, so these are the non-local, the category of non-local modules. So this is, a, this is a fusion category, but not a modular tensor category. But if I take its center, I get a modular tensor category. And this modular tensor category is the same as the modular tensor category of modules of, um, well, in this case, of the, of, the, of the smaller VOA, in this case it's VG, the Deline product of this with the modular tensor category of the bigger VOA, which in this case is V, and we have to reverse it, whatever that means. It doesn't matter what it means because in our case, this is just VEC. So this, just, this is just the unit. So what we get is that the center of rep A is this. So this is a general relation that holds not in the orbifold case, but in any case you have a finite index thing going on. And so in our special case, this is the center of, rep A is our twisted module thing, 
This is what we just figured out is vec g omega. And this thing is the thing we're after. So it's an it's, it's a immediate corollary of stuff that we've known for a few years. So, um, so anyways, so what my grad student and I are going through is just with some knowledge of VOA theory, some knowledge of tensor category knowledge, just going through and cleaning up some of the connections between the two. And I think the plan ultimately is to understand all finite group orbifolds at, at some level, understand all finite group orbifolds of these lattice type theories. So it should be something that, so at least we can go, we can go quite a ways anyways. Probably, we're, no, we're certainly not going to get to the finish line, but at least we'll take a big bite out of the problem. So this should be purely group theory VOA stuff. So that's the plan. And so what good this is for VOA people, well, actually, what I'm hoping that is that they'll talk to me about the kinds of th questions they'd like to know. So for example, the kinds of things we know are um, what are the possible extensions of, of such VOAs. So these are, gonna, um, these are things that are, you understand from tensor categories very well. And so, um, so for example, all possible extensions of, of, a, of a Grinfeld double of a finite group, these are all known. Um, Modular data, of course. So, um, so um, for all this orbifold stuff, you're always going to see this ambiguity by H3 of your orbifold group. That will always be there. So you'll always have an ambiguity. And so, um, so I, I, I can, if I if I know what kinds of information the VOA people get pretty easily, I can help you identify what that three cycle is, and then um, and then you know everything. You know everything about the category theory, the, um, which is everything there is to know about the representation theory. Well, maybe not everything. You don't know the, the graded dimensions, for example. But you know, you, you know, you're not too far off because you know how they transform as modular forms. Okay, I'm past my time, and you've been very tolerant of me. You've listened to me for four over four and a half hours. My God, um, and so, so thank you for that, um, for your tolerance for, with me. Teddy, thank you so much. So, is there any comments or questions? Yeah. Um, right. So, if if you take a cyclic group uh, orbifold, then it's it's easy to read off uh, what this co-cycle is from the matrix. Right. Yeah. I'd say like the the conformal dimension of yep. the pick some generator of the group. Look at yep. the twisted module. And then its conformal dimension tells you this class. So, is there some expectation, uh, more generally, that, like how you can read off this class in group cohomology from, say, conformal dimensions or something like this? I think you'll never have a general um, result for you choose your favorite group G, then dot dot dot. But if you restrict to some, you know, relatively reasonable group, like you're never going to be doing orbifolds usually by, um, you know, by it's relatively simple simplish groups that you're going to be doing orbifolds by. So certainly for things like um, um, odd dihedral groups, it'd be a piece of cake. Um, but um, so you tell me what kinds of, what classes of groups you'd be interested in, and then I'll tell you the tests that work. So there's ways to see um, the, the, co the, the co-cycles. One of the things, that, there's consequent, one of the consequences of the co-cycles is it generally it increases the, um, the order of, of the twists of the T matrix. Um, another consequence is there can be fewer um, simple modules. Another one is there will almost always be fewer extensions. So there are some indirect sort of evidence, but the simplest one is always the T matrix. That holds a lot of information. So that would be the, the nature of it. So you tell me what kinds of groups you'd be interested in knowing those kinds of theorems for, and then I, I'll, work, I'll, I'll work it out. Or I'll the get my student T matrix of the fixed point subalgebra. Um, yeah, I mean, I. So I mean, so I need to know what groups you're, you're interested in orbifolding by. So what would you like to know the? Thing well, about? say say a holomorphic vertex algebra orbifolded by some finite group. Yeah, but that's too big of a class to have a good theorem, like a really effective sure. theorem. So what but class of groups? So all even or odd dihedral groups, all mm -hmm. groups of like of um, SL two of a finite field, or you know, I don't know. Just come up with some class of groups that are actually meaningful, and then then it'll be possible to say stuff about right. it. Right. Okay. But when you say T matrix, I mean the T matrix of yeah. Sorry, the, the T matrix point. will be um, so that it'll be the T matrix. So you'll need to know the conformal weights, not all the conformal weights, but you'll need to know some of the. So probably you'll, the best way is to know the conformal weights, some of the conformal weights of twisted modules or something like that. Mm. Okay. So, um, but.
but I mean, you tell me what information you can get, and then I'll I'll see what how it constrains things. Okay, yeah. well, it was more of a hypothetical question. Yeah, but, right. But yeah, yeah, so right, so. But yeah. Okay. Thanks. Can I ask a question from the remote audience? Is that something that you guys hear? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, hi, this is um, Andre. Um, so um, I have a question about that very much relates to the previous one, to the question of Jethro about conformal dimensions of twisted modules, except that now I, I care about twisted modules in this more general sense that you're, that you're using, not just twisted by a group element. Um, is it known on the, on the is it known that the conformal dimensions of these twisted modules are always um, rational in some um, uh, rational numbers? In the conformal, the conformal weights of the, yeah, so the conformal weights of, um, I want to or say. Or do you expect them to be rational numbers? I don't know, like. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know what answer I want to say, but I'm nervous now because this is being taped. Um, so I'd say, of course, they're always going to be rational. Um, <laughs> but then you're about to give me a counterexample or something like that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a genuine question. Yeah. Okay. So, great. so I think the answer. So it's it's possible the answer is easy, and I'm just being dumb right now. Um, or um, it's possible the answer is very subtle. I'm tempted to think that it's it's going to be rational, but um, actually, you know, like what I'm what I'm being nervous about actually is the, um, so as you know, um, so in the conformal net picture, these are going to, these correspond to solitons, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not sure if they're going to be rational numbers. Like a, I, I, I should just say, I don't know, that's a good question, and um, um, I'm happy to discuss this with you. Yeah, okay, thanks. I mean, wh whether or not these end up being rational numbers is going to affect how easy it is to formalize this in the language of VOAs, that's my guess. Right, it might be that um, if they're not rational numbers, then what you might have to do is your, your um, expression for what your, your vertex operator looks like takes a very different form. So maybe it's, so. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't know either. So that's something that, that uh, is, it's an, it's an interesting question for sure. And so, yeah, it comes down, I think it comes down to the, the definition of, of these twisted VOA, these twisted vertex operators in the, from the VOA point of view. So, um, so maybe Thanks. that's something we can talk about next week. And it's nice to see you virtually. Let's thank the speaker again.